Hey, what's going on, y'all? It is our pleasure to welcome in the coolest man <laughs> in college football. And of course, that is Coach Rick Neuheisel. Every time I talk to him, he's doing something smooth, whether it's on a golf course, uh, teaching guys how to hit in minor league stadiums, whatever the case may be. He, again, the smoothest and coolest man in CFB. Coach Neuheisel, what's up, man? Thank you so much for joining us today. It is my pleasure to be with you. That's the best picture you could find of me, the former coach CBS analyst, Rick <laughs> Neuheisel. That's what it's looking like. Uh, it's fourth and 29, and I don't have a play for it. Is that what the one you could come yes, up with? Yes. It's kind of like all that? this all this beautiful decoration I have behind me here. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. If you're listening exactly. on podcast, yes, uh, we have chosen uh, to send a to our guest. <laughs> Where he is looking that's discombobulated. A lot, that's hot shots right there, Murray. That's probably yeah. after you you riddled me for like 300 yards that night in, yeah. in Arizona. Aaron Murray's mm. last greatest victory was yes. against uh, those. Same my last shots. raw was against New Heisel. Like that was my probably the best game I played in my entire post NFL career was against the hot shots there in Arizona, taking down New Heisel, the undefeated. You took me down. Shots the took me down, which yeah. is why I can't afford you know all the fine appointments yeah. that you mm -hmm. have behind in your backdrops on your screen wait so Aaron, what team were you playing for at the time this the i Vipers? was the, no this was the legends this was aaf not xfl oh yeah 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 That's and right. you as you get a kick out of this so i'm at my son's school so they drop off my three-year-old then all the kids are playing parents get to hang out before the bell rings and there's this guy like staring at me and i'm staring at him like i'm like i know him i don't so i like you know my wife a few weeks later is like and we actually went to his house for his daughter's three, four-year-old birthday party for the birthday party. Those still didn't say hi to him. Age you find yourself. Y'all still in never your, said in hello. Your you never said right hello. Now, yeah. Never said hello to him. I'm like, why do I know this guy? Well, my wife, like two weeks later, she's like, you know what? I figured out who it was. It's Charlie Ebersol. He moved to Atlanta. His daughter goes to this, is in the same the class as my owner son. of the AAF, yeah. right? So I'm like, which, he probably which, thinks that like I don't want to talk to him because he owes me money still. The Alliance like, of I'm American Football was what we thought the AAF stood for. Yeah. Actually, it was adaptable, adjustable, and flexible. That was what those teams <laughs> needed to be if we were going to be successful. Yeah. Man, this I did quick Google uh, search. This guy looks too young to own a professional football league. But hey, what what what? what, what Shut up, Charlie Ebersol. Um, <laughs> it was me some cash money. Come on, Charlie, <laughs> pay up. I think we're a lot of us in that category. I was yeah. gonna say, I I, I I would say take a ticket, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. the butcher, take a ticket, and we'll see. Uh, we'll yeah. serve you when we get to you. Yeah. Um. Exactly. All right, let's talk some college football guys oh by the way i hope everybody had a wonderful christmas i hope you had a very good christmas i know i did my kids said dad you're probably the best dad ever it was the most fun <laughs> christmas day ever it was awesome um so merry christmas to both of you uh but we we're preparing for the new year and in the new year comes college football playoff games let's start to break them down let's start with the big boy alabama michigan once again alabama given the nod the opportunity to compete for a national championship. And this time it's against a team that's been the one seed pretty much the entire year in the Michigan Wolverines. Uh, Coach Neuheisel, do you believe this is the year where Harbaugh and the Wolverines can finally break through or shake off whatever weird, you know, playoff miasma seems to snag them the last couple times out? Uh, I, listen, I, I'm a big fan of J.J. McCarthy. I think he's been undervalued as the Michigan quarterback because they've just decided that they're a land acquisition type of program. They just want to mm -hmm. grind you up and play old school physical football, which, you know, to each his own is, is a way to win. Uh, but I don't think they're explosive enough to, I think they're the least likely of the four teams in the college football playoff to win it. Mm -hmm. I, I think they're the least likely. Mm -hmm. If you look at what they did in their game against Iowa, they averaged, and listen, we all know Phil Parker is a heck of a defensive coordinator, but they averaged less than five yards a pass and they averaged less than two yards a carry. You can't win if you can't score. Yeah. The history of the college football playoff is you've got to be hot at the right time and be able to move the ball. And I just don't think right now that's who they are. I don't think they have nearly the explosive players that the other three rosters present. And as good as their defense is, I don't think they've been really challenged with a great offense. 
the best offense they played all year was Ohio State. And I think that Ohio State was not the same Ohio State that we've seen over the course of uh, the last 10 years. This is an Ohio State team that finished in the 30s in college football in, in terms of the rankings. So uh, to me, this is mm-hmm. in, the wrong teams favored when they put yes. Michigan as the favorite here. Alabama here, should be the favorite. So this is not as much – this is more playing devil's advocate because I said it on yesterday's show, but my intuition leads me to kind of the same thing that you said. But then you really start to think about it. So, like, what's the difference between Bama looking awful against Auburn and Michigan looking awful against Iowa? Okay, fair point. Uh, we know that uh, – that game at Auburn is always a tricky one uh, for Mm -hmm. Alabama. It's just historically, whether it's a self-fulfilling prophecy or what have you, that one's always a tricky one. We go back and look at Hugh Freeze's game plan against Georgia. They ran for over 200 yards in that one as well. So they just have a nice little recipe for that particular defense that Mm -hmm. styles between Kirby Smart and Nick Saban kind of from the same family. Uh, the three, four front. So they have a, a way of dial, dialing up offense. So I give Auburn credit. Uh, but as I look at Michigan and I look at JJ McCarthy and, you know, the touchdown passes and the big plays, they just mm-hmm. don't look to create that. And if Michigan thinks that they're going to get through uh, Alabama on the in Rose Bowl uh, Monday or the Texas Washington winner, by, you know, grinding it out and, and doing so with a 21-17 type of victory, I think they're sorely mistaken. These are going to be yep. big play uh, games that are going to require you to score 35. I, I want to get into the head of the coach here. And obviously, Nick is is the greatest, and his postseason record shows part of that in the championships and winning in the playoffs. And, you know, Harbaugh has not had success in the postseason, has not had success uh, in the playoffs the past couple of years. What is we always talk about? We always talk about from a player's mindset of a you know, regular season, the championship weekend, the playoff weekend. What is it like for a coach? Like, what makes a coach better suited for playoff compared to other coaches? I grew up in the UCLA program where Terry Donahue won eight straight bowl games. Eight straight. Now, this is before the college football playoff became, so th- these might have a different uh, recipe. But, but the idea was that there needed to be some measure of reward as, to go along with the hard work as you prepare mm-hmm. for these games because everybody else is home for Christmas vacation, right? You want to make sure that this is a pleasurable experience, not something mm-hmm. that's just mundane, grinded out, and so on and so forth. Go back to Harbaugh's first year at Michigan, they went out to play the Orange Bowl against Jimbo Fishers at the time, Florida State team. You know, they said no to the jet skis. Florida State was the only team that showed up to go out there and have some fun. And Michigan got whipped Mm -hmm. in that game, despite being the favorite in the game. So to me, you have to have some measure of that. Nick Saban doesn't necessarily present himself as, you know, the ambassador of fun, but I think he has, you know, realized over the course of time, that there has to be some of that. And so I think uh, that's all part and parcel of the recipe for Alabama as they have been clearly the standard bearer in the college football playoff. Having won three times, having been there multiple times, Mm -hmm. uh, I I just think that this is a – and we also – and this is to me maybe the biggest point. The ability to continue to grow over a three-week period now, Michigan's getting this three-week period, too. But to grow the offense for Jalen Milrow in the quarterback run game. Tommy Reese didn't have an offense for Jalen Milrow early. Mm-mm. It has grown by bits and pieces over the course of the time. You saw in the Georgia game a couple of key quarterback run opportunities there to seal the deal. As you have three more weeks now to grow inventory in that regard, I think it becomes the X factor in this game. What about, so speaking of a quarterback run, like when I look at Michigan's weapons, right, especially going against that Alabama secondary, which is the best in the country, um, it's like, ah, how, how is Michigan going to break through? Are, are they going to have to hope that they have a healthy J.J. McCarthy and is him adding to the run? Like, is the only way for the Michigan weapons to have success is if you can somehow 
force them to respect the rushing attack and is the key to that J.J. McCarthy? Like you mentioned that you can't just sit there and expect to run over Alabama, and I would imagine Michigan believes that as well and, and would know that as well. So how do you craft a game plan against what looks to be arguably the best defense in the country? I think that you you hit the nail on the head. If I'm looking at this from the vantage point of Michigan's offense, I've got to have J.J. McCarthy's legs as part of this recipe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to. Uh, mm -hmm. We have built – I mean, if you go back and look at J.J. McCarthy's box scores over the course of the season, they're somewhere between 15 and 25 passes for the large part. There's a couple games that are outliers, mm -hmm. but that's what they do, and they just grind you up and, and play fantastic defense – play a little ball control, and win the games going away. Uh, ended up kind of bludgeoning you to death. But again, looking at the offenses that they played, they were uh, they, they could afford to do that, play the field position game. This game is going to be different because Alabama's explosive. Mill Rhodes, mm -hmm. not, we just talked about quarterback run, which I think is going to be the key, but go look at his yards per attempt. It's over 10. Yeah. I mean, he mm -hmm. has great accuracy down the field. Isaiah Bond, Jermaine Burton have been, you know, big time weapons down the field. Uh, they have the ability to get you into all that, you know, eyes in the backfield who, who's got the ball. And then all of a sudden, here comes those deep over posts, you know, down the field to whether it bond or and, and to really confuse safeties. It, it to me, you have to be able to score with Alabama to beat them. and. Michigan's going to have to find ways to either incorporate downfield throwing or quarterback run. And I think the easier way is to do it through quarterback run. Do, do, do you, are we over the, the Jalen as a, a turnover guy? Like, do you think it's completely cured? I mean, or is that still in the back of everyone's mind? Of like that can still poke its nasty head out at some point. And also we may look up and Milro throws two interceptions in the first half. I think what's happened, Aaron, is that we've, gone if you're talking about Alabama they've gone yep. to a place where they're not asking him to read the entire field no you know they're it's it's not necessarily a read so here's where your your throws should be I think it's more of a progression read you know one to two to three uh that's not to say that Milrow can't do the other stuff but it, it was it was difficult for their protection to be mm -hmm. in drop back and it mm -hmm. was difficult uh, for him to get exactly what he was looking for from a read standpoint. So they've gone more to this play action off the quarterback run game and opportunities down the field that uh, are, are much better suited to maybe actually adding more to the protection or uh, uh, giving chances to, to seal somebody from a safety standpoint and play one-on-one -on -one against a corner. Uh, so the Alabama offense also fascinates me because as you like, we all we, explosive is the word, right? It's not right. the most consistent on a play by play basis, but they've cut out the mistakes like Aaron alluded to. And then they really just have this explosive element. Uh, how do you game plan against an offense of that nature? Cause I feel like we don't generally see that this often. Like if you're an elite football team, I feel like you tend to be a bit more solid on a down to down basis than what you see out of this Alabama offense. It just feels very uh, kind of feast or famine at times. So what's the key to, to forcing Bama? Uh, how, how do you take away that explosivity? You, yeah. You've got to take away big plays, which means there's got to be great communication in the back end between corner mm. and safety. Uh, they got to be great communication. Most of the times defenses split things into half fields, right? We always count from outside in and okay, who's got one, who's got two, who's got three counting the receivers the furthest away from the ball and then play off that. Like you might lock one, meaning one man to man and play zone against numbers two and three. But ultimately with Alabama, they, cr they cross hemispheres. They mm -hmm. go from one side mm -hmm. of the field. So the hemispheres of the defense have to be in communication. Uh, or they've got to travel with the guy who's going from one hemisphere to the other. And that takes, that's what's going on in these three weeks and that kind of communication. So you don't give up the big play to Bond or Burton as they've made people pay over the course of the year. If you can make Alabama beat you via a running game, beat you uh, in, in a 11, 12 play deal, we've seen Alabama make multiple mistakes mm -hmm. from a penalty standpoint. They've had multiple games where they've had double-digit penalties. We've mm -hmm. seen Alabama give up protection issues, uh, and we know Michigan has a formidable defensive front, front seven. So to me, don't give up the explosives and play ball with, with Alabama, and then you've got to 
uh, make some explosives. That yep. to me is going to be the Michigan uh, plan, and whether they're up to it is going to be curious. Or you can have the big turnover too. I mean, that's, that was one of the big Obviously, differences in the Georgia game. Obviously, turnover is always a factor. Yes. Yeah. G- Georgia turned it over inside their own 15 yard line. Alabama turns into a touchdown. Like big games like that against two teams very that, similar. That was, that was the difference. It. That was the difference, yeah. right? That was the difference in the game. Yeah. All right. Last one on this one before we move to the other game. Just your, your final score prediction. I said it's going to take 35 to win the game. I'm going to go uh, uh, Alabama 35, uh, Michigan Whoa. 17. Whoa. Ooh. Wow. Ooh. Wow. So Coach Neuheisel Ooh. down on the Wolverines. Uh, all right, uh, Aaron, take us to what I find to be the more exciting and sexy round one matchup. Yeah, well, this is definitely the, the more exciting. You took Coach, you talked about all the explosive players that an explosive You guys are that saying that the Michigan Wolverines and the Alabama Crimson Tide, number <laughs> one and two in the history of college football, isn't sexy? Are you kidding me? No, it's me? sexy. It is very sexy. It's just not in the, the granddaddy of them place. all. I mean, oh. holy smoke! You can't hey. ask for better. Hey, uh, New Highs, I'll tell you this: like, that's more than what we're going to get out in the in, in Pasadena. They're 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 yeah. classic Hollywood starlets. Yes. But I'm into these young Instagram yeah. thoughts. Okay, okay. You're going I'm, I'm into these I'm into these TikTok, TikTok stars. Okay. Right. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Texas Washington TikTok stars. I I'll be honest. I'm, like I, that is more my game. Like I don't want to. 40 to you know 42 game i like a nice little low 30s mid 20s type of football game so i'm 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 uh, digging more of the michigan alabama but as we transition to the other game now look at uh, these fine my. pictures of michael Penix and quinn yeah. yours right there you came up with me and the hot shots looking forlorn for that PG, can we find just a quick one Holy before the end smokes. of the show just to make you know help rick out maybe in the suit <laughs> for cbs looking fresh that makes, gives me some sort of hope goodness uh Husky boys. I'm dealing with two Husky boys over here. Uh, Washington, what, what, what's what's the initial thoughts when you saw this matchup? Well, remember, they played each other in the final game last year. Yep. This was the Alamo Bowl matchup. So uh, they know each other. Uh, they've, they've spent three weeks studying each other. Mm-hmm. Pete Kwiatkowski, the defensive coordinator at Texas, uh, was the defensive coordinator at uh, Washington with uh, Chris Peterson. So these teams and Sark, as we know, is the head coach at Washington. So these teams know each other. Uh, I think people diminish what Washington has accomplished because Mm -hmm. number one, it's in the PAC 12. So it's the afterthought. And now clearly the afterthought, because we've already had a funeral for the PAC 12. Uh, Washington's won 20 in a row. Yeah. 20 in a row. Thank you. Thank you. Put some respect on that man's name. That is a and and Kalen DeBoer just was named the AP Coach of the Year, uh, mm-hmm. deservedly so. Mm-hmm. It's built around Penix, Michael Penix, the transfer from uh, Indiana, who obviously had a relationship with Kalen DeBoer. They were together at Indiana. Follows him now to uh, Washington, and they have made beautiful music together. Absolutely beautiful. There are three gifted wide receivers mm-hmm. and, and others that play role plays. The tight ends are an understated value to the Washington uh, offense. But these three receivers are all ones. Polk, yep. uh, McMillan, and Adunze, which is maybe the, the, my favorite name to say. Rome Adunze. I mean, if it you is great. let that roll off your tongue, I don't know what's the matter with you. But uh, those three guys are phenomenal. Uh and an offensive line that is right now, I think, up for the Joe Moore Award. Uh, they're mm-hmm. one of the four finalists for the Joe Moore Award, which is given to annually to the best offensive line uh, across the country. This Washington offensive line versus that Texas defensive front, in particular those two defensive tackles, mm-hmm. uh, Devondre Sweat and Byron Murphy, if, you, if they can hold those guys up and those guys don't bang the you know, push Penix out of the pocket and push him off his timing, and I think Washington goes up tempo to keep those guys from having a lot of success doing that. If that happens, then the then they are in position to be in rhythm. And then the newcomer to this offensive equation, which is Dylan Johnson, the transfer from yeah. Mississippi State, who's been brilliant. He had 250 against USC. No big deal. Everybody runs for 250 against the Trojans. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> the bottom line is <laughs> that will be played back somewhere. No question. Yeah. But uh He is a real factor. Give you an idea. We know about this Oregon-Washington rivalry, right? Mm -hmm. Oregon has lost the last three to Washington. 
Dan Lanning in his three goes against uh, Kalen DeBoer is 0-3, and each game was a three-point loss. The first game, Oregon ran for 300. Washington ran for 100. The second game, Oregon ran for 200. Washington ran for 100. The last game, Washington ran for 150. Oregon ran for 124. So you saw an unbelievable switching of the Mm -hmm. physicality and in the trenches. And if that physicality travels to New Orleans, give me the dogs. Wrong team favored in this one. Uh, Coach, help me out here because Kalen DeBoer is someone whose overall head coaching record is just unbelievable. I mean, 103 and 11, right? But, you know, a lot of it took place on lower levels of football. But I'm a big believer that, like, I put stock in if you're winning championships, I don't care the level you are outperforming your peers, right? It's one of the reasons why I gave them the nod over land, all that other stuff. Uh, So like, yeah, give me the coach's perspective. What is it about Kalen DeBoer that has made him such an unbelievably consistent winner at every level of football that he's been on? Well, obviously we, I only get to watch him on game days. I've met Kalen. He's a wonderful guy. He's kind of a, understated guy he's not trying to be you know the life of the party he's um but he, he he obviously has a way of galvanizing a team making sure everybody understands what the what the requirements of being on the team are uh and making sure that people are adhere to those requirements and that there's glue there's there's glue in this room you don't win 110 uh, or 100 games 90 percent of your games if you're yeah. not doing this <laughs> some, something right right so uh give credit where credit is due. He was fabulous at Fresno State when he got that job mm-hmm. uh, and and had tremendous success there with the Bulldog program and then got this chance. And as I said, has won 20 in a row. 20 in a row, that's, that's a mm-hmm. phenomenal accomplishment in a league that plays nine conference games, mm-hmm. in a league that uh, you know, you're not necessarily lining up with superior talent every time you're playing, you're just playing better. And this panics and these gifted receivers. Now, if we're X and Oing this, what I think is the genius in this, and I haven't studied it like I'd really like to, Aaron, but yeah. I think they play with a lot of three ride receiver sides, okay? Mm-hmm. And play with numbers two and three in a in really creative ways. Whether they're switching and then coming back. They make it very difficult. And because you're playing numbers two and three, the corner that was sitting there out there locked on number one, he doesn't get involved in the pass defense. They mm-hmm. don't, they rarely throw to one. Yeah. It's it's a two and three well, world yeah. that is huh. playing as a two receiver side, and they just have all sorts of things that cross over and they huh. just occupy people. And well, we're seeing some of the best receivers in the country do that. You know, Luther Burden, slot receiver. I mean, that's always been right. their philosophy there. Uh, neighbors played a lot of slot for LSU, too. I mean, they yeah, moved inside um, a ton. The whole like, world of a one route tree, meaning mm-hmm. an outside receiver route tree being at number two or number three, and all that putting it on safeties who now yep. have to have corner responsibilities and the inability because of a running game if you put a Dylan Johnson involved in that, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So I can't reroute number three, meaning I'm in his face or in the face of number two. I can't reroute those guys and have them actually in position to be mm-hmm. in a run fit. So that halfway split is not, it's, it's like the equivalent of a single side receiver bringing him down into a, you know, a nasty split as we used to call mm-hmm. them, right? They're just four yards away from the tackle. That corner that comes down with him now has to play outside leverage because he has to be in the run fit. Yeah. He has to have the outside gap. Now he can't reroute the safety, uh, reroute the wide receiver, so that receiver now gets free access on a safety mm-hmm. who's sitting there flat-footed, mm-hmm. not in position. Mm-hmm. He doesn't go and play one-on-one against wide receivers in, in practice, and now you can have a corner or a, or a post on him, and if I've occupied the rest of the other side of the field, I'm I'm having my cake and eat it too if I can hold up. And this offensive yeah. line, as I said, is one of the top four offensive lines in college football. They're giving Penix all kinds of time. And the guy has dropped dimes. If you watch the yeah. highlights, these so little nice. rainmaker balls just land on the money over oh, yeah. and over again. So it's which way do you want to die? Pick your yeah. poison. 
Uh, Rick New has the best looking analyst in all of college football. Now, that's a Wait, damn right good that's a yeah, looking. Look at that. There's a good looking picture right there for 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 Mr. New Great looking picture. Uh, everything I, you know. Whenever we hear this game, it, I, I feel like so much of the focus is so much on Washington's offense, Texas's defense, the lack of of, of ability to cover on the back end, which has plagued Texas 95th, this season. Ninety fifth yeah. in the country. But we, we forget that like Texas's offense is pretty damn good. Oh yeah, with weapons, with an elite quarterback against a Washington defense that is good. Maybe be- I would say better than average. It's a good defense, but like they, we don't talk enough about that. Like they, I think Texas can score a bunch. They have been. They have been better. Yes. Uh, yeah, they're as, pretty damn good in that Oregon game. And 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 listen, Very go back to the offense. Arizona State game because the offense was struggling. You know, True. they got they gotten attacked in the A gaps and they were struggling. And that defense with a pick six changed the deal. So this yep. defense has been opportunistic. Uh, they'll play great. They're going to give up points. We're we're in for a, a 38-35 game. I yep. really I yep. really yep. think we're in for that, which is going to make it really exciting. I just think that. Uh, the way that Washington has won their games over the last several weeks puts them in position to not panic if they're in that situation again. No, I, I, I'm a firm believer in that Washington's extremely battle tested, but also, as you mentioned, uh, they've been very adaptable this mm-hmm. year, right? They've won a ton of different ways. On the Texas side of the equation, I'm guilty. Uh, I was a huge Sark doubter, right? You looked at the resume and, and you saw a guy that has had a ton of big jobs, right. but had never won 10 games anywhere. And it wasn't like those jobs weren't capable because Chris Peterson came in right after him, did great, like Lincoln Riley immediately. Like, like you you saw guys who would go in and immediately do well where he just was. And obviously there were some personal issues mixed in there as well. But the point is, I was a big Sark doubter. Um, he proved me wrong and then some. Uh, Texas managed to win without their starting quarterback. They were consistent. They were great offensively like they should have been, given that that's his side of the ball. Um, have you seen anything out of Sarkeesian, his growth as a coach that maybe led to this breakthrough? Or is it as simple as, well, they just have an incredible roster. <laughs> I mean, they got the money and yeah. they can get really good players now. Well, I, I think if you look at Sark's background, he worked under Pete Carroll uh, mm-hmm. and learned – you know, Pete was let roll the balls out there. Let get a bunch of great players scrimmage all the time and see where the dust ends up. And we're going to have a great team. Mm-hmm. It was a raw, yeah. raw, it was a raw, raw type of way of going about it. And Sark was all in Lane Kiffin was a part of that whole world. Mm-hmm. They both blossomed from it. Uh, maybe not as buttoned up, maybe not as discipline oriented uh, in that environment. And so both those guys, when they got their opportunities, certainly went and did the player accumulation thing, but didn't have the details. There was mm-hmm. not a real attention to detail. And so things got through the cracks, which required both of them to go to what I call the happy ending halfway house of Nick Saban. <laughs> they, they basically went to their rehab. Yeah. And I yeah. I don't mean that in in a way that's disparaging towards Sark. They went yeah. to they went oh, to yeah. uh, the the Alabama halfway house and basically learned how to pay attention to the details of football. And both of them have benefited greatly from that. Whether mm-hmm. they enjoyed the experience, whether it was something that was they couldn't wait, they were counting hours to get out of. They both profited immeasurably, whether it be perceptionally where people now think that they have a little bit more Saban acuity to them, or whether it be they actually were paying attention while in that, call it a de- house of detention or house of uh, uh, attention. You pick the, the terms you want to use. But both of them, if they paid attention, as we think now they did, are way more detail-oriented detail, detail oriented mm-hmm. than they were prior to going there. Uh, you I wish I wish had when I got fired. I wish I had gone to Nick Saban's. <laughs> I mean, look, dude, I, 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 go, I, coach. I, I think I think Edo's very happy to be making his seventeen mil and kind of chilling. But certainly, it's so funny to hear you say that because Ogeron was the same way in terms of that Carroll philosophy, and then he too, just after the success, started playing a little fast and loose, and yeah. It, lost it, a little bit of that detail. Both those guys were fun lovers, right? They have mm-hmm. lives yeah. away from football, but they learn yeah. <laughs> about the, you know, painstaking attention, the devils in the details, the painstaking 
process Nick Saban lives. that Nick mm-hmm. Saban lives in and one day at a time. And both of them have built programs by accumulating talent and now trying to follow that model. They both are yeah. tipping their cap, whether they mean to or not, to the greatness that is Nick Saban. All right, so and, Coach, you said you, you said 38-35. 38-35, taking the which, dogs. Taking the dogs. Mm. You already know, baby. We, you, got, you got dogs, Alabama. I don't know if we'll get you on the show before the national championship. Who wins the national championship? Uh, you know, I really want to say Alabama here just because mm-hmm. I think that's Nick Saban. But I think yeah. Michael Penix, I, I think this is the offense that wow. might be the uh, – might be the one that can get through to that secondary and, and mm-hmm. put some issues. They will leave. I don't know what Washington coach Nick Saban can hire before that game actually <laughs> takes place as he did with George Hilo from, yeah. from, uh, from Michigan. I don't know who he's going to get in there. Remember he interviewed Ryan Grubb. He tried to get yeah. Ryan Grubb to come and yeah. be his offensive coordinator. So there's no question that he shook Ryan Grubb down trying to learn mm-hmm. about Washington's offense. Uh, but I, I, I kind of like Washington. I kind of like Washington to win the thing. Woo. That would and be wouldn't incredible. that be the appropriate way for the Pac-12 to finally oh get the last right. shovel of dirt thrown <laughs> on top of them? It's parade time in Pasadena, where tradition meets college football action in one epic bowl game. And with DraftKings Sportsbook, you can make every play count. New customers can score $150 instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on college football. So if you think this is where Michigan and Jim Harbaugh finally break through, or you think the song remains the same and the Crimson Tide and Nick Saban lift the trophy once again, either way, you play on DraftKings. So download the app now, use the code TBOB, T-B-O-B, and new customers score 150 instantly in bonus bets for betting just 5 bucks on college football. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code TBOB, the crown is yours. Okay, I'm going to ask a very self-interested, well, maybe not self-interested, but we didn't have this on the run. I'm going to go off script for a second. But it's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Washington, Oregon going to the Big Ten next year. Mm-hmm. Who's better set up for success? Oregon. Oregon mm-hmm. has the more sustainable model because of the mm-hmm. Nike stuff. Yeah. Their ability to uh, finance their expectations in Eugene, even though it's not you know a television you know entity, uh, they have the ability to recruit nationally because of the Nike brand. Uh, and that sets them up for success going forward. They're right now, like right now, number two, if you look at the big 10, as it will be constructed going forward, they're number two in recruiting USC's number five, right? They're number two in recruiting only behind Ohio state. And to me, Dan Lanning, I, I got a chance to have him on our program on full ride on Sirius XM. He was phenomenal. That, that mm-hmm. story of Dan Lanning being a high school coach in Missouri and driving 13 hours to go get a job with Todd Graham at Pittsburgh uh, without even having an interview, just hanging out and then being at all the different places and paying attention as he has. Uh, I think Oregon for the long term. And, and it's going to be hard for Washington to replace all that's going to be leaving yeah. at the end of this yep. year. So enjoy this run, dogs. And another program that you obviously have close ties with Colorado and you've, you've seen yeah. the, the build this year and you've seen kind of what they're kind of doing next year, heading into the big 12. Can Dion win in that conference with the team and kind of how he's building? Like what, what are your expectations for next year for, for, for the buffs? I have mixed expectations. I, st- I don't think that Dion's learned everything about coaching that he will learn. Mm-hmm. So there's still much to do in terms of putting his staff together and, making sure all the pieces fit. Um, it becomes even more complicated when the number of the players are your kids. Not yeah. that they aren't worthy players. They certainly are. But when that relationship's making it more difficult for you to really evaluate your coaches, I mean, for Sean Lewis to get demoted there and get the head coaching job at, at San Diego State, that's a head scratcher, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, but uh but Dion is Dion. Dion is the real deal. I was with him in Baltimore. He's authentic. He mm-hmm. recruiting will not be the problem. It will be the complication is always is people, right? Yeah. How do you get people together that are all pulling in the same direction? And to me, given Dion's attention elsewhere at times with you know the branding, the Amazon show, 
the uh, commercials, it just becomes difficult. I go back to Nick Saban. Nick Saban, the devil's in the details. Dion says that Nick Saban's one of his heroes. Dion would be do well to study Nick Saban if he mm -hmm. does, if he wants Nick Saban type of success. And this is a man who knows, longtime college football head coach, CBS and Sirius XM That's analyst. Looking analyst. There we are. Oh, look at that. Poor, renaissance man, mm -hmm. the coolest man in college football. One of the only ones that could break down a defense, give you an offensive game plan, and then sing you a little ballad as you lay your head down. We on the do pillow that. at night. I should have brought my guitar to this, guys. We could have we could have mm. come up with a ditty. Hey, Coach, I'm going to send you the video of T-Bob was in the ballet the other day. Little Nutcracker. You should have seen him dancing with his little tights on. Not to brag. He wasn't tight. He was a, you, you never know, say a, little a, tights appropriate to T-Bob. Never say little <laughs> tights. Yeah. Thank you. Also, if I ever, you know, as my ballet career continues, if I ever do wear tights, I'm absolutely wearing a cup. You know, yeah. you got to, you got to, you got to feel comfortable. You got to feel good up there. I can't be worried about like shrinkage or anything like that <laughs> when I'm on stage in front of all Probably an overshare, probably an overshare, um, but yeah, uh, potentially. we appreciate it. Listen, no, will you yeah. do me a favor and give yeah. my best to your dad? Absolutely. One of, one of the all time great first meetings I've ever had in my life. Aaron, where, where, where I don't know if this? you knew this, but this Bobby, Bobby this? was the quarterback for the Michigan Panthers yep. while I was yep. at San Antonio Gunslingers in the old USFL. Ah. And I had a roommate uh, in my first year in the USFL, which was year two of the league, uh, that had been on the Michigan Panthers the year before as a fullback, a guy by the name of Mike, Mike Hagan. Hagan. Mike Hagan. Yeah. So Mike Hagan and I are roommates, and Bobby comes to San Antonio, and we're, he's hanging out in our apartment. I have to, it's, Mike Hagan had to serve as an interpreter for me to understand what the hell Bobby That's was like saying. his, that was his partner, partner. Rest in peace to Mr. Mike. That was I his know, like best Mike. friend ever, dude. Mike, so oh, yeah, yeah, that's how I, I know y'all were I, real I said, ones if he was hanging out in the apartment. Dad and dad and and dad and What is he saying? What the hell's happening uh, here? But yeah, the, uh, shout out Mike Hagan too. Bobby Power Hebert. team. The power oh. power lifters for Jesus. That was our, yep. that was Mikey. That was Mikey. Hell yeah, yeah. man. Oh, awesome. Um, I will definitely do that, Coach. I can't wait to ask about that. Actually, <laughs> even though it's probably going to suck me into like an hour long conversation. Uh, one of the, one thank of a you, kind, man. One of a kind. You guys are gems. Pro college football needs more like you. Uh, it's always a trend. Oh, wow. And as Look we that. always say, Look at that. as the dismount of these conversations is, if we always will say the same thing. We need adults in the room to fix the problems that are exist in college football. Hopefully that will happen soon. But no matter what we try to do to screw it up, college football always delivers. Mm -hmm. Always. There go. Always. There we go. Always. There we go. Some very sagacious Nah, didn't really land the dismount there. It's very wise. Uh, it's a very Multiple wise syllables always makes people think you know what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. A very wise perspective from a very learned man, Coach Rick Newhouse. Thank you so much, Coach. And uh, yeah, we will see y'all for some more snaps later this week.